Okay, I'd like to bring this meeting to order and I will accept the motion. So moved. Seconded. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Kyle's going to set us up, is he? That's, yep, yep, there we go. go. All right. Are we intact? <laughs> okay, so uh, continuing with the main meeting, um, do we have any uh, selectmen's reports? Well, Jeff here, I, I, yeah. I'm not sure if this is the right time to ask about, but I would love to, I, I had, was approached by a, a resident um, asking about uh the process the the i guess it's going to be called the acadia outdoor center something over in seal harbor that i had heard nothing about and the and the process of uh, how that came to be where it is as far as uh the town's approval to to move forward with some project involving kayak rentals and a business over there i don't know anything about it but i i know that there's more than a couple of people that are not thrilled with the way things went let's put it that way the so. plan, you know, that's going before the planning board. Okay. And that, they'll yeah. have an application, I'm assuming, at some point in time. My understanding, I guess, from this resident, which may or may, may not be accurate, but was that it was uh, it was supposed to go before the planning board and then that they said that they were going to have a hearing and people could come in, but then it was approved because of uh, existing, existing retail. I, I, I don't know. I just, I know that there's a couple of people that were upset about it. I just don't know anything about it. So I couldn't respond in any way, shape or form. What happens, Jeff, on the issues that go before the planning board? After they are adjudicated, then they can go to the, if people are unhappy, then they can go to the zoning board of appeals. That is the appellate group on the planning board as opposed to the select board. It goes from the Zoning Board of Appeals into Superior Court. So it gives you a chance, you know, you can be you know, informational clearing houses and things, but you don't have appellate uh, jurisdiction over those decisions. Okay, I see Kim's hand up. Can she chime in about that? Yeah, go ahead, Kim. Hi there. I'm, I'm not sure if my reception's good. It <clears throat> keeps breaking out when I heard Jeff talking. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, this was um, a proposal that was sent around, I guess, um, to a couple of the summer residents in Seal Harbor, and um, <clears throat> which is ideally they were um, asking if they could have some financial <clears throat> assistance. It's a call. <clears throat> Um, Rob and Hansen are looking to do a variety of functions out of that building. Um, they would like to sell outdoor gear, um, do kayaks, uh, rentals, do bike rentals, um, off coffee and ice cream. And at a future date, or maybe at some point down the road, they would like to do a climbing wall. <clears throat> and there was a activity type of area that he designated um, for crafts and other items. And so the, the, there was a planning board meeting held and Mr. Whitehead and Mr. Bear came and spoke. Um, They were asking, um, hey, I ideally did, decided not to do the climbing wall and the activity area <clears throat> intending to do the bike rentals, the kayak rentals, the coffee, the ice cream, um, and then the uh, retail of the outdoor gear. Um, I spoke to Mr. Whitehead and Mr. Bear after the planning board meeting 
Um, I even checked with Maine Municipal to check to see if this use would be similar to retail um, store, which ideally fell under that if they were doing kayaking and biking on premise, and that would be a different. Uh, Mr. White had contacted Maine DOT on my request see if there was any issues with Maine DOT. Um, I spoke to the, or he spoke to the state fire marshal's uh, office. They don't have any jurisdiction because it's already retail for retail. This is gonna be real. Um, there are some suburb residents that are not pleased with the fact that uh, this would fall under the scope of the CEO. Um, and like Durland, it's, if a permit's issued, which a permit would only be issued ideally is if they did some structural changes to the building. Um, but other than that, this is kind of where it is. It's, it's under my purview. Um, I haven't seen ideally the parking plan. Mr. Whitehead had sent to DOT, but like I said, DOT had no concerns. Um, this lot is probably the only lot in that area that has on street, I mean, on premise parking. They could ideally do up to nine to 10 spaces. But this is kind of it in a nutshell, just to kind of give you a heads up what it's about. Okay, thanks, Kim. Thank you. All right. Anything else on that? Okay, let's move forward and uh, look at new business. Uh, Mount Desert Elementary School budget review. Um, Gloria, is that going to be you? Yes. Can you Hi. hear me now? Hi yeah. there. Good. Um, so I have a, a presentation I'd like to share with you. So is it all right if I share my screen? Yeah. Thanks. Gloria, do you see where to uh, share screen? Should have I do, I do. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Are you getting the spinning wheel of death? Um, no, I'm getting system preferences. Mm -hmm. I know, I think it might be worse. It's all right, I think Wendell stayed here to help me out. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm gonna have to leave the meeting and come. John, while she's doing that, I just have one more quick selectman um, report that someone sure, sure. Um, mentioned that the pile of snow at the end of um, Sergeant's Drive, right, sort of on 198, it's it's very difficult to see when you go to the end of Sergeant's Drive to turn out onto 198. Mm -hmm. And it was just asked if maybe that pile of snow could be broken down or moved somewhere else and it's just it, apparently it's kind of dangerous getting out onto 198 from there okay daryl and you want to uh yeah, i'll take care of that for okay no problem john <laughs> yes uh, john if, is it okay if i just uh share something real quick please sure go ahead thank you so much well i just wanted to uh while we're uh, i think gloria is just navigating the technology piece but I want to thank um, you and, and Derlin and the rest of the select board for the opportunity. I think Gloria is coming in, but we're working with Derlin on um, if we're still in the COVID period, which we all hope we're, we're going to move forward from that, of how we can plan thoughtfully for town meeting um, and, and working with both Derlin and other town managers to host something where we can collaborate and, and make that as efficient as possible. So um, Appreciate the opportunity to do that. And I think Gloria is ready to go. Hi, dear. Sorry about that. Um, can, can you all hear me and see everything? Yep. Awesome. Thanks. Um, it's been a busy day at school. So, you know, I've thought a lot about how to share things with you all. Um, and I'm going to take you on a quick chronological tour of our school um, from starting back in um, March 13th, um, actually March 12th. Um, just so you can have an idea of how things are 
and then I can talk quickly about, about the budget and answer any questions you may have. So our second graders from two weeks ago, um, they're at Seal Harbor Beach. Um, Notice them physically distanced, but they took the maiden voyage in our new um, Honda Odyssey vans that we were able to purchase through CRF funds. Um, we have two bus drivers. We need three bus drivers. Um, and with the high school schedule change, we haven't had the ability to take our students on field trips this year, which is pretty weird because our students are usually out in the field all September and October. So um, um, using our COVID relief funds, I was able to purchase these vans and we're able to um, get our students out and about um, with a whole list of rules. Um, and um, they travel 10, 15 minutes away from school and can only be outside. We've only done one trip, but isn't this great? They were on a photography field trip with their teacher, Ms. Jarvis, and our art teacher. Um, this is Friday, March 13th. Um, our jazz band wasn't able to go compete, so Ms. Graves... Um, had them do a performance for the teachers. I tell you, it was um, pretty emotional. It was beautiful, um, but it was also quite sad. That's the last time a horn has been tooted in our school. Um, I'm looking forward to um, hearing music in the hallway again, hopefully soon. Um, that's my wellness team. Boy, if this is a public meeting, they're gonna be happy I'm sharing this photo. But um, I wanna tell you the next morning after um, March 13th, I met with these people. Um, that's Chef Emily Damon, um, Andrea Howell, our behavior coordinator, Wanda Fernald, our nurse, and Tara McKernan, our school counselor. And um, we sat down and we said, okay, who's going to need help? How are we going to organize this? How are we going to communicate? And um, what's our plan going to be? And um, we haven't stopped since. I met with the wellness team, and then I also um, put together an operations team at our school. That included um, Leon Sargent, our director of maintenance and transport, Julie Hodgson, um, all the people on the wellness team, um, and some teachers um, to help us plan our academic programming during time of COVID. Um, so those two weeks when we went dark, um, we were working nonstop, um, and it was hard and kind of scary, but. Um, I think we did a pretty good job. I'm really proud of my staff. Um, there we are. Um, we turned things around by the end of March. Um, we'd never done remote learning and, um, um, but boy, we're pretty good at it right now. Um, but there we are in our first ever line, um, having parents stop by to pick up um, learning materials, devices and food from our school. Um, I want to tell you that um, during remote learning, we had um, over 61 families sign up for food service. That was 900 meals per week that Chef Emily and Jane Carroll put out to our community. 56% um, of our students received meals. Um, we provided uh, food service and material delivery to 14 families in our community that weren't able to come to school. And um, we created the family support form on our website and I put it out to parents all the time so they could connect with us and they could let us know what they needed, whether it's support with internet service or food service or social emotional support for their students or family. Um, I don't know, guys, I don't wanna bring you back to March, but it was a pretty tough time. And um, um, I'm super proud of our, our school and Chef Emily and all the work they did to make sure our kids were connected. Some teachers would eat lunch with their students and they'd all be eating food from Chef Emily. And um, that was kind of a unifier. That was a nice, a nice thing. Um, there we are. Um, that's our first sign in. We've come a long way since then, but um, their chef and our art teacher, it looks like delivering, um, getting the food ready to be picked up. Um, so even though we're in remote learning, there's my school. Um, <laughs> Isn't that great? Um, that was, you. if you can see, probably can't see my cursor, but um, there's Coach Norwood right there. Um, there's Heather Graves and, oh, I don't know, our specials teachers ran field day. And so we had an all school meeting um, and boy, wasn't that something. And then we proceeded to have a virtual field day where the kids participated in their own activities. Um, they were divided into teams with the green team. Oh, there's Senora, the red team. Heather was yellow and oh, our art teacher, Shannon was blue. Um, and they competed and they posted, there they are, 
they posted their um, entries um, on Flipgrid. So we really learned a lot of technology and the students were able to teach their parents <laughs> how to use their cell phones and how to take photos and um, submit their videos that show the activities that they did. It was a real unifier. So even though we were apart, we worked really, really hard to, um, to be together and stay connected. There's our, um, our promotion celebration from last year, um, last year's eighth grade class sitting down there. We had it um, down at the marina. Um, you'll notice the teachers are all gathered there. Um, they came and did a little drive-by parade. Um, and that was, it was, I don't know, it was kind of sad. Folks had to sit in their car, but they beeped the horn and celebrated for the students and everybody just did a great job. Um, so we regrouped when the students kind of, um, when we wrapped school up and everybody returned everything and tried to figure out what was most important as we looked at opening school um, during this pandemic. Um, here we are on the side by Gil, Gil Patrick Lane, um, just below our garden, teachers are meeting and connecting. Um, and what rose to the surface was the physical well-being and the social emotional well-being of our students um, that was what was most important. And um, until we paid attention to those and made sure we were all set with that, then the kids weren't going to be able to learn. Um, and so what did we do? We focused on recess and we built our schedule. Um, my boss is here, right? And there's Dr. Gass. Yeah. So we built our schedule around recess. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so what's ideal, what's the best situation? The best situation for these kids is to get them together, to get them reacclimated, um, to get them moving um, as much as possible. And so our students, K-8, all have three 30 minute recesses a day. And in these images, you'll see kids of all ages playing um, out at recess. Yes, even middle schoolers have 30 minutes of recess a day. Um, just a little snippet of support for having students in school. Um, we were, you know, our schools are so much more than, well, we're just so much, I guess I should say that way. Um, we provide social emotional support, we provide food, we provide um, love and attention and um, healthcare, we provide so much to our students. And um, um, it was clear that our students were feeling isolated and things were pretty tough for families. And so what was most important to my school and to the people that work in my school was um, opening our school back up and, making sure the teachers were safe, parents trusted us and they were aware of our plans, the kids were safe and that we were able to learn in person and together. Um, there's just lots of reasons um, to support in-person learning um, and it allows schools to make sure the students are connected with one another. Um, it helps the growth and development of the whole child. It helps, boy, it helps families um, and it's a, just that connection, our students were missing that connection. Um, that was this morning, wasn't it a beautiful morning? Just, and Leon, didn't he plow the best snow banks for our students this morning? They had so much fun out there. There's our middle school students. Middle school students like to be outside and be connected too. Um, they shoveled off the cage. Um, and there we go, we have three 30 minute recesses per grade level. Um, you know, thinking about recess as a social emotional classroom, um, students are learning conflict resolution, they're learning how to compromise, how to share, they're learning how to be flexible thinkers, how to be in control of their own bodies, how to advocate for themselves, how to play, um, how to follow rules, how to challenge rules when they don't feel like they're fair, they learn patience and risk taking. Um, they're developing their social emotional intelligence and doesn't that sound like a lot of things that people in our world need right now so um, here we get into more of the business part of things so our enrollment this year's held pretty steady from last year we have 161 students 15 of those students are enrolled in um, the virtual academy that started um, that Julie Meltzer started this late summer um, for this school year. So the students are enrolled in our school, but they attend um, with teachers from all over the district. Um, this was the forum um, about August. And that's how I'm pretty sure the inside of my brain felt in August. 
it was a pretty tough time. Um, so what do we need to do? We needed to figure out how many kids were actually coming back to school. So we had to wait for the remote or the virtual academy sign up to be done. We measured all the rooms. We knew the square footage. We had to figure out how many students we could fit in each space, depending upon the physical distancing that needed to be between each kid um, and the teachers. We emptied those rooms out. We emptied them and emptied them. And that just is one snapshot of all the work that those teachers did to make school ready. Teachers moved classrooms. And then when a few more kids enrolled, um, maybe they moved again. We have teachers um, teaching in places that they, they haven't taught before. We have ed techs helping out, um, organizing pods. Um, we can only have in some rooms seven, eight students because of the size of the classrooms. And so um, we've really had to adjust and adapt how we work. But um, the students that are in school, the 147 kids that are in-person learning um, and the, the, the 15 that are in the virtual academy, 15% uh, of those students have IEPs. They're identified as um, um, having a learning disability and they have an individual educational plan. 6% of our students have a 504 plan and 4% are identified gifted talented. Um, I'm really proud of our RTI program, our response to intervention program. It's something that we've really worked on over the past few years and um, we have streamlined supports and meetings and um, interventions that, doc that we document to help students that are showing that they need a little extra support. All of that is done before students are referred for special education. Um, boy, so we started the school year off with, um, with remote learning. And so um, our teachers were so happy to see the students and families. And so even though it was after the work day, um, they were all there to greet everybody. And so the kids, the students all got their learning bags and their devices. And it was just a beautiful, wonderful community moment. Hey, there's some eighth graders for you. Um, um, that's um, early on in remote learning this fall. Um, I see some smiles, I see some um, happiness there. Um, and then this was the best ever. Um, the first day of in-person learning, we scaffolded students in, kindergartners, first grade, um, and then a couple of days later brought second and third in and so on all the way up to eighth grade. And um, it really worked well. Um, we were able to um, really um, help the students acclimate to our new rules and procedures. These kindergarten students and their parents, those parents dropped their kids off and um, said goodbye and smiled and waved, took the pictures and um, sent them into a school that most of them have never stepped foot in before. I think that's a big testament of the trust that um, our school worked to build with those parents. Um, we had parent and family forums, many of them in the summer and the fall and just had some recently um, so that pa families could ask questions and um, really understand what our expectations are and what our procedures are to keep the students safe. Um, our school has a, you know, when you enter on Joy Road, you're upstairs, that's an upstairs zone and we have a downstairs zone. Our kids that are downstairs, K-4, they don't come upstairs and the kids that are upstairs do not go downstairs, same with the teachers. I do have some roving teachers that move to and fro, but for the most part, everybody stays on one floor. So these cute children that you're looking at, I've never seen my office, I've never been upstairs, I haven't been in the music room. Um, it's, a, it's a thing, um, but they're, they're doing great. They have been in the gym, they have been in the gym. Um, we have traffic patterns that folks follow. And for those students that do get instruction outside of the classroom, we have documented pages and pages of when they go there, how they get there, who they're with, um, who's there, when they're there, when they go back, just so if we ever need to do contact tracing in our school, we're able to know exactly where everybody is. Um, we have, just so you know, had three confirmed cases of COVID-19 in um, individuals associated with our school, but there has been no transmission of COVID-19 in our school because our students and our staff are wearing their masks and they're washing their hands and they're watching their distance. Um, they're doing a great job. Um, oh, there they are right there. That's um, first few days of school. There's our counselor, Ms. McCurdy, and working with the students to learn how to um, watch their space between each other and use the hand sanitizer. This is something that's a good testament for, for a good, I don't know, uh, support for why we're working so hard to keep our kids in school. Um, 
we put out a family support form so families could, could ask for help. Um, the reason we made that form was to give teachers time to focus on teaching and learning and to really try to support families with the social, emotional, internet, food service needs that we could, our wellness and operations team so the teachers really could focus on teaching and learning. Between March and June, we received over 125 requests for support from families um, and 12% of the families reported their child was struggling and that was remote learning. Um, in September, from September till now, we've had 116 requests for support and only 3.6% of the families report their um, child struggling. Um, that the operations team and the wellness team helped me man those forms and we're able to get back to families pretty quickly and so um, to provide that support for the families. Hey, there's our office manager, Angelique Hodgson. She's running I grew up in Vermont, so I call that the Zamboni. I was, they grew up in a hockey rink, so I don't know what they call that, but that's the, the device that they clean the floors with here. Um, I just wanna make sure you guys are aware of just how much our staff really want our kids to be in school. Um, we were faced to either shut down for two days or clean our school ourselves when we had a staff shortage. Um, and my staff had the school cleaned in about an hour and a half, the whole school cleaned. And we divided up zones and everybody took different jobs and um, it was remarkable. And in, we were supposed to have a staff meeting, but instead of a staff meeting, we cleaned our school. So I'm pretty proud of them. Um, so going back to school in person, there's a lot of things that were the same and a lot of things that were different. Here's our cross country team, they're, they're running um, and uh, they did wear masks when they were running, but you'll notice, oh, there's our soccer team, aren't they sharp looking? Um, they wore masks when they weren't playing, but when they were playing games, they didn't wear masks. Something to pay attention to is that, you know, the, um, the protocols or the recommendations or, or the information that we get changes and evolves. And we make sure we're always following the CDC guidelines and um, the framework that the DOE put out. Um, so school was still awesome. Um, so what did Miss Westfall do? She brought the pottery wheels outside. Miss Patty grew one of the most beautiful gardens I think our school has ever had. Um, and I'm just gonna give a little shout out to the sixth grade because they really um, went above and beyond um, helping out in the garden this year and harvesting. Oh, there they are, relaxing. Um, those chairs were all donated to us um, by the McLaughlin family. The sixth graders did a great job putting the garden to bed and um, just helping out Miss Patty in the garden, all in all. Um, some things did look different. Here's uh, one of our kindergarten classrooms. Um, we had two kindergarten pods, a, a, a pod of five and with Ms. Wheaton and a pod of five with an ed tech. Uh, Ms. Wheaton works with all the students, but they got together some for art classes. And so um, we were working things out. So the kindergarten room looks a little different than it usually does. Um, other things that we're doing to really try to um, think outside of the box to provide time for teachers to plan and for the kids to get um, the experiences that they need and deserve and that make our school special. Um, we came up, our art teacher and P teacher came up with the Mustang Collaborative. Um, oh, it says collaboratory. Um, so, you know, once every other month, the students have about three to four hours with um, coach and Miss Westfall where they have a, um, pretty much a day camp um, where they get to do movement activities and art activities in the gym. Everything from tie dyeing to scooters to um, relay races to, I, I don't even know what they have planned for the next time, but that time's pretty special for our students. Um, our art time and PE time has been cut down um, and um, this helps provide some of that the physical movement and the artistic outlet for the students and um, they love it and it gives the teachers planning time. Mustang Explorers is the name of our program that we have for our vans. Um, teachers can be certified to um, drive the vans and bring the kids out in excursions around town and Irma, this is a bit of a stretch, but um, it's the early release Mustang afternoon program, Irma. Um, some of my more clever ed techs named that. And so what that is, is essentially is we have Thursday afternoons where teachers are able to um, participate in professional development and collaborate. And um, our ed techs have created a program where the students in K-4, hopefully K-6 soon can stay in school 
and our bus drivers have volunteered to do an afternoon bus run so the kids can um, the kids can stay in school and we can provide transportation to them. They do things like ride on the scooters, they learn ASL. Um, this is uh, one of our interpreters on this, on this Google Jamboard. This is um, Miss Amber Sharon. She's teaching ASL to, it looks like the first grade right there. Um, she's in another room in our school, um, but she's doing that because her mask is off so that she can teach the student with signs. And this is Carter. Carter just harvested those radishes last week. Don't they look good? Awesome. Um, and that's just a glimpse into um, the vans that we bought our bus. And um, Mr. Sargent, who actually was out training, Erin Allen, who just received her CDL permit um, and is training with um, Mr. Sargent to get her CDL license so she can be a bus driver too. So um, if we need anything, we need bus drivers, um, even part-time bus drivers. Um, oh, whoops, that was a typo, sorry about that. Um, this is a- um, Gloria. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but for those that don't know, Mr. Wood, Selectman Wood is also certified bus driver and he helps out a lot. No so, way. Oh yeah, absolutely. He, 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 he went down that road. So I, I love it. Aaron's putting together a presentation so we can put it in our newsletters. So you want to be a bus driver because it's not that hard, I hear. Um, these are the kiddos at Mustang Collaborative uh, making tie-dye shirts. You wouldn't believe it, but this is probably late November. Um, and they've been eating outside, working outside. There's um, a young potato harvester from our garden. And there's the corn going from our garden. It's being harvested to um, Chef Emily um, preparing it for our students. Um, but our garden was just, it just welcomed everybody back this fall. It was a, it was a beautiful, beautiful garden. And we're so grateful for Miss Patty. Um, there's our sixth graders. Um, um, our sixth graders also um, did a uh, food drive for the Bar Harbor Food Pantry. Um, and this just in, um, during second semester, we were able to um, move the first grade out of the art room um, and they're in a regular classroom. So Ms. Westfall, our art teacher, actually has the art room back now. And this is the kindergartners during one of our Thursday afternoon programming or programs um, working with clay. They're so happy. And kids in boxes. Um, <laughs> we've got a lot of new technology at our school and some of them came in big boxes. And I'm not sure what was more popular, the boxes for the littles or the tech for the big kids. Um, they loved those boxes. We learn outside all the time too. Um, this is Miss St. Dennis's math class outside, um, out behind the school and just some of our cuties at recess. Um, there's Mr. Mako, um, our, without having bus drivers or being able to go on trips, the um, teachers do take the kids down to the waterfront frequently um, and they do some outside learning there. Our art show this year is gonna be at the um, Northeast Harbor Library. It will be up probably next week and it's a photography um, exposition by our whole school that Miss Westfall is facilitating. We keep the joy going. We had a, um, a festive mass competition. Um, I did, as much as Mrs. Gray's gingerbread house was enjoyed by the children, she did not win. Um, but we do pretty much whatever we can to keep spirits up at our school. Um, Christmas was over, Christmas break was over. Um, we returned to school um, two weeks of remote learning. Boy, have we learned a lot. We were able to um, uh, modify our schedule to um, have more time on task for our students. Um, our, the jam boards that we purchased for the teachers allowed them to actually stand up and teach while they're teaching remotely um, and really made learning interactive between the teacher and the students. And we were so happy to be back in school together on the 25th. Um, and here we are, um, there's coach. Um, getting the side eye from one of our kindergartners today in PE class. And that's little Jackson, a kindergartner out at recess this morning. For the budget this year, um, I, the additional items that I have are listed here. Um, what's most important to me and to our staff, I think, and to our families and our kids is to keep our kids in school um, without being able to predict what um, the, uh, 
where the pandemic will be in the fall. Um, at this point, it's really important to me to prepare for, for anything. Um, right now, uh, Ms. Graves is teaching sixth grade um, and she is our music teacher. Uh, Senora Beal has been teaching fifth grade and she's our Spanish teacher. So I've put two one-year um, teaching positions in the budget for next year, just as a one-year um, ask, because if we are still in COVID um, conditions and we need to keep our students um, physically distant apart and we need to have reduced numbers of kids in pods, those positions will really allow us to keep up the level of programming that's important to us that our kids deserve and that also um, we can increase the time the students have for art, music, and Spanish and PE. Um, I've also, um, another additional item is to increase our tech integrator teaching position from 40% to 100%. Currently we have a tech integrator who um, serves our school two days a week um, with the increased need for um, technology support, technology instruction, um, and um, just, I don't know, um, our students needing to be digital, um, savvy digital consumers. Um, this position is something that would benefit the students. They'd be able to provide some STEM activities for our kids. They'd also be able to provide some coaching and instruction to our teachers and provide some supports running our um, data management system, the power school system that we use that um, maintain students great. Um, the last thing in here, I have um, added $5,000 to put towards a um, pre-K collaboration where our school work with, um, you know, families at the nursery school or families, pre-K families in our community um, to provide support and collaboration, some professional development um, with parents and with the nursery school regarding pre-K programming and helping to get our students ready for the pre-K. It's my goal to put pre-K programming back into the budget for the following school year. But it, um, yeah. So those are the, the additional items in our budget for next year. And that is where I'm gonna end. John, can I just uh, quickly add one thing? John, you still there? Yep, go right ahead, Mark. Okay, well, I, I'll just very briefly, uh, I think it's fair to say we all have our own personal experiences <laughs> and, and views on, on COVID, but I could not be more proud of, of Gloria, the teachers, uh, staff, kids. Um, this has been an extraordinary year. Um, and uh, I think Gloria has given a really nice snapshot of how people have tried to be malleable, how they've adapted. Um, it's not perfect, but as I talk to superintendents and colleagues around the state, New England, and frankly, across the country, I'm really, really proud of where we're at. Uh, can we improve? Yeah, we're learning every day, but as everybody knows, um, information and the dynamic that we're in changes almost daily. So can't thank you folks enough for your support. And I just want to give a shout out to Gloria. Uh, and her staff, they're doing an amazing, amazing job. And we have enjoyed phenomenal support from the select board and the community in the past. And we just appreciate everything you guys do. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have anything? Yeah, just one. Um, and maybe this is just me. Um, in the format that the budget is presented, um, I've noticed this the last few years. It, again, maybe this is just me, but I prefer to see um, the new requests sort of a little more integrated with the overall budget. So it's more of a full picture of where we're going rather than, well, here's one budget um, and whatever increase we have. And then here's sort of the separate thing. I just think it would... I don't know. I, I, I think it would, the, the, I guess the optics of it to me would be a little bit better if it was presented as a whole budget rather than separate budgets, essentially. Uh, John, may I just yep. do a fall? I just want to make sure I'm clear. You, you're talking about the school budget or the overall budget? Uh, well, like, I mean, for example, we just went through the slideshow and I, the slide we got at the end was it sort of the additional items yes. are listed out separately. I just... Yeah. Well, even if they're just highlighted somehow, just sure. so 
incorporated into um, the overall budget rather than being separate. I appreciate that. And I think what's important um, to, to make sure that you have, I want to make sure, A, after the school committee approves it, that you have a copy of that budget. But that has been very intentional. Uh, when I came on board five years ago, I wanted in an effort to be very transparent, we wanted to show what a turn, insofar as possible, what a turn the page budget was, but also not to have items that were new or additional in the budget where people could not view them. So I think to your point, it's really important as we break out those additional items once they're approved by school boards and or select boards, we absolutely can integrate those in. But I, I, I think it's really, really important to make sure that people see that total picture of what the turn the page is existing and what the new requests are. So we'll work out, we'll work to make sure that we can provide you all of that information. Well, and they can still be highlighted within the actual budget, whether it's literally a highlight or just bold or something else to indicate that's sort of a, a new item for this budget cycle. Yes, I understand. The only reason we try to break that out is to show the impact of turn the page, but I, I understand your point. We'll work okay. to, to make sure we integrate that. Thank you so much. So Gloria, I'm looking at this and I'm at the bottom line is we've got the big increases are the two one year teaching positions and three and a half ed techs. Um. No, uh, the two one-year teaching positions, yeah. yes. Um, the tech integrator, um, which is a one position. So yeah. um, our school has had someone two days a week and I'm requesting, um, proposing that we bump, we turn that position to a full-time position to provide the support that mm -hmm. we need. Um, and then the other one is um, an affirmation of our school's commitment to creating pre-K programming for the Mount Desert community um, by establishing some outreach and partnerships with families and working with the nursery school to provide some professional development and um, uh, family forums and, and training regarding getting students ready for um, public school for kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So actually, one of the, what I was referring to with the ed techs was the was uh, looks like you've got a sixty eight percent increase for three and a half ed techs. I don't. I did not increase the number of ed techs that um, we have on staff for the following school year, and maybe that there's a shift in the in the funding line. Oh, okay. All right. So you're losing the Title I grant. Is that what that is? John, uh, Nancy's on board too. Um, some okay. of that can be a shifting of either benefits or also if you look at one area that's increasing significantly, that typically is an offset. John? Yep. Um, Gloria was correct and remember there were some ed techs that were reallocated from special ed to regular ed for next oh, year. Okay. All and right. also um, the title one grant is getting little smaller and smaller each year. And the RTI position was added into that regular ed tech line. Mm -hmm. That's why the, um, the increase. Uh, okay, so it moved mostly. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. May I ask? I noticed this uh, similar when I looked at the special ed um, salaries. The teacher salaries for resource room went down by looks like a whole position, and then the RTI position. I noticed is that is that a re? Is that just sort of a moving of? Oh, oh boy, Jeff. Um, yes. Uh, so we have twenty students in our fourth grade class, and um, they are located. This year, they're learning in our cafeteria. And so um, our, our cafeteria, our food is delivered. I'm getting there, backstory. Um, food's delivered um, to all of the classrooms or outside for our students. Um, we needed to have two teachers for the fourth grade um, this year. And so Karen Sharp, who's a duly certified teacher, she's a special educator and a general ed teacher, um, was, I'm, I, 
I can't tell you the number of things I've had to ask our staff to do. And so a few weeks before school started, I, I asked her if she was um, amenable to being a fourth grade teacher and she's jumped right in and she's doing a great job. So yes, we went from three special education teachers to two special education teachers this school year. And uh -huh. so um, looking ahead at next year, you know, one of the things I find that um, it really helps when you're you're looking at a school K-8 is looking at um, hiring staff that have the most, you know, that, that have the most credentials, the credentials that make it possible for them to work with the most students. And so I always look for teachers that are K-8 certified. And um, I'm now even bumping it up a notch and looking for teachers that have that dual certification. If they have special education and general education certification, then we're able to, um, use them at different, you know, in different years, depending on our needs. We're a small school, you find the right people. And, um, and so you may see some shift here and there between the special and general ed budget lines, depending on what kind of year we're having and what jobs people need to do. I hope that helps a little. Yeah, I just, I mean, so for next year, you're, you're planning to still just continue with two special ed teachers. Yeah, we're, I'm working with, well, I'm working with this, the resource team right now um, and trying to figure out how to support them. And, and, you know, that may very well turn into a, looking to hire a, a dual certified person who can be half special ed, half general ed. But um, I can't speak to staffing just yet because, you know, some folks may be retiring or um, some folks may decide that maybe this is enough. Um, and um, can't, uh, yeah, but, right. <laughs> yeah, and so I I have to I have to wait and um and commit when I feel like I have a good handle of staffing and our needs. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Don. Yes. Happy to, and I know um, you know whether it's be myself or Gloria, Nancy. If there's any follow up questions that any of the select board uh, has or, or anyone else, just let us know. We're happy to do a follow up. Uh, uh, you know, and just make sure that that all your questions are answered. Yeah, well, I don't have any more questions. Um, anybody else? I, I would just like to say, Gloria, thank you. I think that like. Looking at the budget is is all numbers and all you know important information, but that slideshow was just real. And um, <laughs> the comparison, you know, like to see where you were back in March and where we all were and and where you are now, and and the the positive in your voice saying, "Look how far we we've, we've come and look what we can do." And um, I just feel like that's that slideshow. You you need to like show that all over the place because I think so many people at schools are struggling and so I just appreciate the time you take to put into that slideshow just it I don't know it reiterates the budget but it really makes it really real for for me this year so I just appreciate the time you took to you can put numbers you can put budgets you can put all that but to take the time for those pictures and show those kids and show how hard you guys have worked and it just makes it all feel a little bit better when it comes to paying taxes for our schools. Thanks, so, thank you. I appreciate that. It's really important to me that people have an understanding of just the the huge effort and undertaking that it 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 is and has been, but just how committed our staff is to keeping the kids in school. Um, I have one teacher at our school whose room moved three times in three days um, back in August because of shifting enrollment, and they just kept going. And um, it, I have never in my long career in public school have had to ask so many teachers to do so many crazy things with such little notice um, and they're doing it and um, they're awesome. And I just want, it's important that the community knows that and sees that and understands that. So thanks. At our school today at our, our staff meeting, Mr. Haney started the meeting talking about what everybody's superhero, uh, superpowers are. And, and one of the ones that came out mostly was flexibility this year. And I, you know, obviously that's shown in your group as well. So we all have those superpowers. <laughs> and yeah. I, will have a, I will have a one page document for you, John, um, that does a budget summary. It's, it's just not done yet. 
Okay, that's fine. That's fine. But that would be handy, just so we yeah. sound like we know what we're talking about. Oh, you bet. You bet. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank well, you. thank you guys. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Gloria. John, thank thanks so much. John. Thank you, Nancy. Stay safe, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Yeah, you too. All right. Uh, next item proposed land use zoning ordinance articles. Noel. Hello. Oh, there. I'm going to have to put in a request uh, for next year not to follow the school with land use stuff because uh, there's no chance of following up with that. Nope. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just not as cool. Well, um, yes. I think uh, this today we we're just going to go over some of the proposed um, land use changes for this year's town meeting and it's a pretty light year uh, for a variety of different reasons. Um, we took quite a pause um, in meetings um, at the beginning of the or right around, you know, for the first half of the year anyway, but um, I thought what I would do would be to just kind of go over them and uh, answer any questions if that works for everybody. Sure. Uh, would you like me to share the screen to show which ones we're going over, or do you guys have copies? I'll share if you don't. Yeah, want to share that'd be fine. All right. So the first one um, to 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 note is we're just making um, this is more of an administrative change. I'd I'd say to to take um, to remove a footnote for from uh, the table of allowed uses related to um, clearing and removing of vegetation, excavation and fill, excavation and fill over a certain number of cubic yards and uh, roads and driveways, particularly related to um, the resource or the stream protection area, um, just to make it more consistent with state rules, uh, state shoreland zoning guidelines. So, um, this is just an example of that. Um, currently, the footnote four actually requires, if you're just doing an excavation and fill project, to, to actually have to go and get a variance from the Board of Appeals, which um, if you don't know, uh, uh, variances are actually designed, by design, supposed to be difficult to get. And these are actually allowed uses um, within, within these districts that don't necessarily need a variance. They actually just need approval from the planning board. So footnote four, um, is actually a little more restrictive than it needs to be and was not consistent with state shoreland zoning guidelines. Any questions? Nope. <laughs> All right. Let's see if I can pop up the next one. You guys see the outdoor lighting on the screen? Uh, this is a continuation of a discussion we had last year regarding modifications to uh, outdoor lighting standards. Um, worked with uh, the uh, with Dwight Lamfer to get some some changes and did did some additional research and this one uh, for simplicity's sake I just struck through all of the existing standards in the ordinance um, and just replaced them with the new um, language so it's not a lot of um, too much new stuff but I reorganized things a little bit too to have uh, the purpose and then the definitions where we have definitions um, you know at the end of the existing, um, standard. So what we're trying to do in this situation is really just make the uh, language in the outdoor lighting standards a little more applicable and more up to date with current lighting uh, technology um, and also a little more enforceable relating to, uh, you know, you really, the language in the existing ordinance requires everything to be like um, fully cut off from adjacent properties, which is technically impossible to do. Um, so we're just trying to kind of ease into um, newer and more um, modern lighting standards. So this is this is basically the um, the uh, ordinance that we tried to get through last year, but there was a, an issue with some of the wording. Is that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And and actually, but so I took what Dwight had done and the and the uh, sustainability committee had done last year modified it a little bit and then sent it back to Dwight um, to, to take a look at. And then he sent me back a version and we tweaked it around a little bit. And then this is, this is the current version of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, eventually the way the ordinance works right now is still, you still have standards and then you still have uh, recommended best practices. 
So we're keeping that sort of model where you have, these are the standards that the board is gonna look at and then there's still recommended best practices in yeah. that um, situation. But it isn't, the attempt here is not at this point to get any more, too much more sophisticated um, so that it's really difficult for Kim to try to enforce, but really to be more, um, more clear and a little more modern. I just have a question in regards to enforcement. Sure. Um, you know, say your neighbor calls up and says, you know, oh, I think Noel's got an outdoor light that's, you know, 4,000 degrees. Um, are we expecting Kim to then show up to measure that or how, how does that work? Yeah, you know, I don't necessarily think it's going to work that. Um, I'm, to find the right terms. I, I'm not sure it's going to work that um, nope. strict, Matt. I think it's going to end up being more... Um, you know, guidelines, um, and particularly when you go to the planning board and you're proposing like a development that the board gets to review, we need to double check um, that these standards are, are being met. Um, I think we'll have to, Kim and I will probably have to work on how we're gonna make this work from an enforceability perspective, but I think it's a little less, little, the idea would be to ease into it a little bit more. Okay, well, and then just sort of along those same lines, um, who who will be driving around on November 14th um, or January 16th to make sure nobody has their um, holiday lights lit a day too early or a day too oh, late? Yeah. And along the same lines, who, um, you know, people throw cocktail parties in their backyards in the summer and they put Christmas lights on the bushes According to this, that will now be, you'll be in violation for those sorts of things. I just, I know a ton of work went in this to this and there's clearly a lot of knowledge there, but once you, I, I don't know, sometimes things work on paper and not in practice. That's my fear and I, as a community, I don't wanna get into legislating when someone turns their Christmas lights on, if we're being honest. That's just me. Yeah, I think, um... We could probably take a look. We have a little bit of time to take a look at this before the formal public hearing on that, Matt. So if it was just sort of temporary lighting is allowable if it's not in conformance with. Yeah, we can we can take a look at that. I think the idea here was really just to exempt what you're talking about so it doesn't become an issue. And so we just put right. put some dates on it. Good. I've highlighted it. So. <laughs> There's lots of people that leave those things up till spring. So. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I think I said this last year too. You know, the idea here is you can go, you can go, um, there's a broad range of um, ordinance language regarding lighting. And what we're really trying to do is, which is sort of the same thing that we've been trying to do all along with your ordinance, is not necessarily to make it more complicated, but make it to be more applicable to what what things that you know the town is actually dealing with um, and i think having those easier. best practices laid out really is helpful to people you know yep. any other questions on lighting and no. thank you <clears throat> all right yep next um this article would change the um setback the, it's it's really to make a change to make it more clear on how um, you're supposed to measure measure a setback from a private road or right of way, and really all we're doing is moving um, this part of definition of setback up to footnote C, so it's more clearly obvious to an applicant or to Kim, you know, and and just to be right up front, this is how it's supposed to be measured. So it's really more of a clarity. Uh, change than anything we don't we're not changing any existing policies it's just to, um, to help the ordinance be a little more clear questions not a one for me all right we'll keep going then all right uh, last one um, this one is to modify the ordinance and the definition of uh, setback so that footpaths and sidewalks are are actually allowed within a setback so there's been a few well currently your ordinance doesn't allow um, like if you if you wanted to have a path between your your front door to the road um, your 
front setbacks, you're, you're a path, that portion of the path that's within the front setback technically isn't allowed because of the definition of setback. So what we did is just to try to clarify that, um, put, put an exemption under, under the definition of setback that includes footpaths and sidewalks. And then um, just to be crystal clear, we had to add a definition of setback or, or footpath so that you know, the footpath is, has a bit of a dimensional standard to it and um, you know, is really for pedestrian traffic and not like uh, golf carts and ATVs. So if I, if I had a house in say, oh, downtown Stonesville, and I wanted to make a path from my door all the way out to the sidewalk, I could do it now? After this, yes. Yes. Okay, yep. so this addresses those issues. Yes. Awesome. Yep. There's right. been, uh, yeah, like up the hill from yep. the town office, you know, you can't make connections to road, parking lots and sidewalks and stuff. So we're just trying to clear that up. Great. Good. Yep. And that's it for this year. We've got a lot on the list. I will say that we've got um, continue to have um, the um, Otter Creek planning on the list. We are uh, actively working on updating the subdivision ordinance. Uh, so I have a model subdivision ordinance, but I think it was just a little bit too much to bite off um, given where we are with public process and, and meetings this year. And um, we're working on uh, some stuff in Solmesville as well. So, nice. Great. And Thanks, uh, no. we'll put the plug in that you're you're very close to um, the time where the comp plan needs to get started, uh, an update on your comp plan. Great. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Noel. All right. Uh, and lastly, consider the resignation of Jean Fernald from the traffic committee. She just turned 88. Can we refuse? Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, a couple more years. Yeah. Acceptance with uh, with much thanks. Seconded. Yes, absolutely. Yep. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Any other business? You have that uh, request. We have this thing from ACT. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, there's Beth. Okay. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Apparently Hi, what that is, is they're applying for a grant to try to integrate <clears throat> alternate energies into, into uh, <clears throat> municipalities and other organizations. So they would like a letter of support in trying to achieve that grant. So it's, it's usually something that we do uh, as a courtesy for organizations that are applying for grants, unless we think that the uh, issue that they're looking for is not in the best interest of the community. Otherwise than that, we've been very supportive of helping uh, sister and brother agencies you know, achieve grants. So. Well, I think in this case, it's a particular interest of the town and to, to be in support of, uh, you know, energy, anything to do with climate change and, and, and changing practices that will help in that regard. So. Uh, well, thank you. Um, if you'd like, I can tell you a little bit more about the grant or um, the project if you're curious. Um, I don't know if um, the committee has time to hear that today, but I um, just want to throw that out there. And also say thank you for uh, squeezing me in, especially during budget season. I know how busy you all are, and um, I really appreciate being here tonight. Um, so our end goal is just to have clean, reliable, and affordable power. And now due to advancements in solar and wind, this is not only attainable, but extremely affordable. The price of solar and wind energy is now lower than fossil fuels and is expected to continue dropping. There are renewable projects popping up everywhere. Um, but the only problem is that the sun goes down and the wind isn't always blowing. Um, technology is advancing rapidly to address this gap through the management of both electric supply and demand, using storage and backup power on the supply side and load shedding technology on the demand end. Uh, what this project will do is pull all those pieces together in a way that will reduce uh, consumer electricity cost and provide consistent, clean and reliable power. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll open it up if you guys have questions, but I don't wanna take up too much space uh, or time right now. 
sounds so like just, we go, support. Go ahead, Mark. I just want to say I'm, I'm in support of it. Yep, absolutely. And you need this. This is required for the the grant application. Our support would be helpful yep. for that. Okay. Yep. Um, so uh, we're applying. We're applying to um, the Department of Energy. Just put out a or a month or so ago put out a funding opportunity announcement for um, for projects like this called Connected Communities. And so um, this would kind of put us on the cutting edge as far as the U.S. grid and. Um, uh, allow Mount Desert Island to kind of pioneer a brighter and smarter future um, uh, in regards to uh, how we use electricity and how we upgrade our grid infrastructure um, before the increased demand in electricity becomes a, a problem for the grid to support. Mm -hmm. So do you, John, do we, uh, Darlin, do we need a motion to to approve your letter of support? Yes, that would be very helpful. So I would move that we approve the letter of support as presented to support this opportunity. I would second that motion. Right. Enthusiastically. Me too. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any Thank opposed? You. Nope. Very good. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Um, thank you for your time tonight. No problem. Okay. Thanks for sending through all that. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> okay. Any other business? All right. I'll take it. I will take a motion for adjournment. So move. Second. Actually. All in favor. Aye. 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 See you later, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.